school, and they will immediately get an email back uh, which points them into a direction uh, in the direction of uh, another web page on our site, which explains exactly how to make a formal application to the uh, uh, relevant university. Um, and it's only once that formal application is made that their, uh, their application can be considered. Alongside that formal application is a, a checklist which captures some of the kind of practical issues that need to be in place for someone to really succeed on the course. And that needs to be completed by the manager or with the manager. So actually, both that formal application and the checklist need to be completed for the, uh, uh, for the application to be considered. Um, and the checklist is kind of a way of keeping everyone uh, in the picture. So, you know, sometimes we have um, people who are from services that uh, have never heard of CYPI apps making applications to the courses, and that's cool. Uh, we will just kind of talk to them um, and talk to their managers uh, because they've given their managers details when they've made an expression of interest and, and talk about what becoming part of the program involves uh, because we know that um, these resources are, you know, generous at the moment, they're, they're free trainings, there's salary support available, and we want to ensure that as many providers can take advantage of this as possible. Um, and this is a bit of a timeline. Uh, so we're already a bit into this. Um, I guess the date you really need to be looking at is the 2nd of October. That's the final deadline for the therapy courses and the supervision courses. So um, really you want to be working towards that. But as Emma pointed out, uh, uh, eruditely, um, in order to kind of really effectively take advantage of these trainings, you need to have done various things to ensure that uh, your service is not going to be impacted negatively and that the person can really make use of the training. And that takes a few months, uh, specifically, you know, ensuring case flow, uh, ensuring someone uh, is in a backfill role. If that's the route you've chosen, obviously you could decide to um, increase the number of hours that someone is working instead, in which case they're their own backfill. I think that's a really neat model. Um, most of these courses start in uh, January. So the therapy and supervision course starts in, in January 2018. Um, the service leadership course, which is now somewhat relevant to us, uh, starts in mid-November. All of this again is on our website. Alex. Yes. In order to kind of guarantee a place, the earlier the better, presumably. Yes. Um, we were implementing what we were calling an early bird deadline, uh, which is to say, if anyone applies by the 14th of July, um, and that uh, means getting that. Uh, complete application in and a signed off checklist, then they could almost certainly be guaranteed a place as long as they meet the criteria for accessing the courses. Some of the criteria we talked about, the criteria also on the brochures over there, it's cutting it fine to say the least, but uh, there is this opportunity. Um, what I think we can say at the moment is that we've had a lot of expressions of interest, but not a great deal of applications, which typically happens. Usually the applications come in on like the 1st of October, which is really frustrating for us. And we, we try to avoid that as much as possible, but it still happens. So what I would say is uh, you definitely have a good chance of getting on the trainings if you apply now, or I think probably within the next couple of weeks. Becca. Okay. Yes, both Emma and I, I think, have emphasised at every opportunity the importance of working together as a system, and I think um, this applies uh, just as much here. Um, I think that there needs to be a kind of system-wide conversation about um, which uh, particular interventions are going to benefit your local system to fill the gaps locally that are going to meet the needs of your local community. 
And so in order to do this effectively, there has to be an ongoing conversation with commissioners. Um, and uh, as we've already observed, uh, there will be a shortfall. You could either absorb the shortfall yourself, in which case, I suppose that's fine, but if you're a provider and you can't do that, then it's crucial to uh, involve your commissioner. So in order to do this, we have agreed with the commissioners that um, we will keep them updated on a weekly basis as to who has made expressions of interest and who has made applications so that uh, they can ensure that they can offer you as much support to take up these training places as possible. I think that echoes what uh, Becca wanted to say. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm aware that I am between you and maybe some questions, but then lunch, and so I'm going to try and do this as succinctly as possible. So this is the recruit to train route. This is a way of creating new roles um, to bring uh, new staff or existing staff who might have a smaller role uh, into the service in order to make use of some of those postgraduate diplomas and certificates in the therapy training specifically. Um, so uh, this year, uh, Health Education England uh, funded um, services to uh, create um, a one-year role, which was full-time. So they, they offer all the salary support for that, up to um, uh, the midpoint of band six, or whatever's equivalent, if you're not within the NHS. Um, plus uh, on costs, um, and uh, any high cost area waiting, which I don't think applies down here. Um, now, that, that would be great for one-year courses. For our two-year courses, that means, essentially, you can create a new role that's half-time across two years for someone who will come into your service, do one of the trainings, so they would be out of the service for a, uh, a day a week, but they'd be in your service for one and a half days a week, so they'd be adding some capacity, and they'd also be bringing all of those additional skills which they'll be picking up. Um, and then maybe if your commissioners are uh, able to, they could be supported to join the workforce properly. Um, so this is an opportunity for new people to join the workforce or for uh, perhaps new roles to be created for staff where for some reason a role may not be uh, continuing. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Because of Tavistock, um, I've just got a text from her because I asked. Um, we've got, there are 11 people currently employed in the Recruit to Train, so 11 trainees. That means they've increased the capacity of the workforce by bringing in 11 people to do this. Um, when this happened, uh, but again, I think it needs a bit of strategy. How do these people who land in a team, you know, step into a team? You know, how, how, how is that understood by the team? So they're coming in, they're going off to do a training, and they're only there for two years. It's very clear that their post is only two year post, but actually in many services now, often <laughs> posts are created that are quite short term because of the way funding is. Um, I think that it started off, uh, we've got 11 at the moment, two have actually dropped out because the course was too much for them. But it's really important that people are aware of what the demands of the course are because that's quite tricky for a service to bring somebody in, start them up on the course, you know, try to embed them into a service and then somehow not managing it. And that might be the fault of the service as well, in terms of how they set up to it in. I think, I'm just trying to see what she says, I think there were, a f the ones who did recruit to train um, previously, I was wondering what happened to them. I know one was in my service and actually she went off to have a baby, so that was quite a lot of times. Um, but um, the others have gone, uh, their posts ended, and they've just gone to, they've got jobs in neighbouring trusts. So you could say, oh no, we've trained them and pay, you know, it's paid for it by our trust and they've gone somewhere else. But the other altruistic way of looking at it is, is that these are people who their, their skills are being used with working with young people somewhere else and people do move on. Um, and it's about the whole workforce in terms of developing skills. So I think it's been actually in that way quite successful. So. Yeah, and maybe uh, as a group of providers working together, there could be one uh, provider who kind of hosts uh, these trainees and then it kind of feeds uh, the system, the more wide, wider system with uh, these additional kind of skills and, and expertise. Does, that, yeah, any, does all of that bit about recruit to train make sense? Okay. Is there a deadline? Um, so 
And the way we're working with this, it's similar to the wellbeing practitioners, we're accepting expressions of interest from providers. So we would like to know how many training places you're interested in, um, why, uh, and, and uh, things like the supervision arrangements for these uh, new posts. This form needs to be signed off by your commissioners, so again, it's a, uh, a conversation with them and, and a kind of uh, collaborative approach. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are waiting for clarification from Health Education England on some of the details in the Wellbeing Practitioners Programme. We're also awaiting confirmation for this Recruit to Train Programme. So what we think is we will have approximately 30 of these Recruit to Train places to offer across the whole learning collaborative. So uh, it might be that you can use a few of those. Uh, um, but uh, if you're interested, uh, we will uh, give you this expression of interest form uh, to, to complete with your commission. Becca, yes? Sorry. Last time. Uh, um, I'm sure not. <laughs> <laughs> and the same question as before, really. Is there an opportunity as Sussex, I'm talking about not just West Sussex, I'm talking about whole Sussex, haven't really had access to this for quite a while. Is there an opportunity to reinvent some of these places for Sussex? And then we need the same answers Yes, except with the caveat that um, if you put, put together a particularly compelling application, then there's a better chance. So that, that's the answer. Um, yeah. Okay, and this is the last slide. <laughs> Um, so, again, our website, uh, my email address, um, and uh, our Twitter handle. Um, that, that's it. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no. Right, thank you for that, um, Alex. If there are any other questions related to what's been presented, you're going to get a chance as we move into the next uh, part of today, which is the um, Q&A panel. So if I could invite up all those that have been asked to join the Q&A panel.